Welcome to the Crossings online experience. We're so glad that you've taken time out of your day to come and check us out. Now our prayer is that as you listen to the talk today, that God would inspire you and get you excited about what He wants to do in your life. So get ready to hear from God today. Hey guys, here's what I want you to know. Fourth of July weekend is a weekend we celebrate our freedom, but I want this weekend to be a weekend also that we celebrate our freedom in Christ. Because I want you to understand that you did not achieve your own forgiveness of sins. Jesus did the job for you. That's the message of the gospel. That he died in your place so that you would just walk in freedom, you'd walk in joy, you'd walk in hope, you'd walk in victory because he did all the work. Is that good news? That's the story of the gospel. Now, here's the thing. For years I thought I understood the gospel and then like a year and a half ago, I re grace kind of hit me for the first time that it's not really about me, but it's really about Jesus. And I started talking with other pastors around the country and I met this guy out in, in Philadelphia or in, in Pennsylvania named Lon. And then Lon introduced me to this musician right here named Alan Scott, give it up for Alan. And about eight, eight months ago or so, Alan and I started talking and we started talking about how Alan's been through it. I mean, he's had a life that's really gone through a lot of struggle. Um, a lot of you in here are addicts. He was an addict for a while. Um, he's been some broken and beat up in bad places. He knows the situation and the story. And God's grace redeemed him. And, he, and God pulled him from a life of sin to this life of joy and victory. And now he spends his life going across the country, sharing a message of grace, both singing, but then also telling about how God's grace has transformed him. So he's gonna sing, but he's also gonna preach in a couple minutes. You guys ready for that? So from this moment on in the service, Alan, it's yours. How y'all feeling? Good? So let me tell you, I'm not qualified to stand here today. <laughs> I'm not. There's nothing about me that is qualified to stand here today upon my own doing. You know, I was born into, you guys, I'm sure so many of you have the same exact story that I do, but like 55% of you guys, my, my parents were divorced and my family eventually ended up going through like uh, three or four divorces. And, you know, I always remember just feeling rejection on the inside when I was very young on the playground. That was what I identified with. So I was always trying to get everyone to, to like me. And because I felt like a loser inside. And as I went on through the years, I eventually got involved in um, just all kinds of just crazy stuff. Uh, crystal meth. I lived in Texas for a while, was homeless, you know, lived in a large uh, gay community and was just all, all from, the, from the time that I was 13 right up until the time I was 21. My life was just full of lying, stealing, dropped out of high school, I dropped out of college. If I knew you and you were, you were my friend, I would steal from you. So I was always running from my friends. You know, I was always getting hammered at night and, and wondering when I woke up the next morning who I'd stole stuff from, who I'd lied to, just this cycle of shame. And I knew that God could never use me for anything because I was a loser and I was stuck. I couldn't get out of the cycle that I was in. And so this cycle would repeat itself over and over where I would just feel shame and remorse. And then, you know, uh, you know, around five o'clock would roll around and I'd be out doing the same stuff. And, you know, I should have, I should have been dead. I had, I stole a bunch of money and drugs from a drug dealer, stole a car. And, uh, you know, this is after I was in rehab already one time, the first time when I was 18 and I took off and the guys came looking for me with guns and bats and um, they would have killed me. And, you know, in my lowest points, in the middle of meth addiction and all my other addiction, I always knew God was real, but I just, I didn't care. You know, I was just running from him. And um, I think I was afraid of what he was gonna take from me. I, I don't know what it was, but I just, when I was 21 years old, I was just, I'd had it. I had the police looking for me for years. From the time I was 18, they were always, getting in the, back, the place that I've been staying at the last time and I was like moving on to the next place. And so I had the police chasing me and I was, I was a thief 
So if you're my friend, I couldn't ever look you in the eyes. I didn't really have any friends. And I just remember being stuck in this place. And I love music. God had put a passion on my heart to play music when I was like 11. And, um, but I knew by the time I was 21, I'd sold all of my musical equipment to pay for my habits, for my lifestyle. And I couldn't get out of it. And I knew I was done. I knew, I knew that God would never, ever use me for anything because I was a loser and I couldn't stop. And that was really depressed, depressing. I mean, how many of you have ever felt like that? That God wasn't gonna, he could never use you. He could never save you out of what you're, what you're stuck in. Let me tell you, our God is bigger than anything that you're struggling with. And his goodness to you is not dependent upon your goodness to him. Because if it was, no one could ever be saved. Right? Those of you who are Christians, how many of you were at a tail end of a winning streak when God found you? I mean, if it was dependent upon that, we're all screwed. And I'm the king of being screwed because I had no, I have, I have no earthly qualifications. But I want to tell you, I, when I was 21, I hit my knees. I was hammered. I was wasted out of my mind. But I could still feel the pain. And I hit my knees and I said, God, I said, you got to help me. I can't get out of this. And I want to tell you, he answered. It was a couple months later where I got arrested. Constable Jesus came and found me. And I'm glad that he did because it wasn't until my 19th day in prison that I realized that he was answering my prayer. I was like, I don't have to live like this anymore. And I went to rehab again and I got a Christian counselor in rehab. His name was Andre. And uh, this guy, man, would just cart me off to his church every Sunday. And I remember this one Sunday, the presence of God just hit me. And I just, for like 40 minutes after the service, me and this other kid, Brett, just were just weeping after the service. And you know, from that point on in my life, that was 2001. That was the last time I had any drug or alcohol in my system. And I want to tell you something. It, it hasn't always been rosy along the way. But one day at a time, God has been faithful to me. You know, my wife's been sober for 12 years. Came out of came out of the same same background that I that I came out of. And we've been married for seven years. And God is faithful. Let me tell you what. I never thought I would have a house. I never never thought I would have a car. You know, when you're sitting on the on the one side of addiction, you can't you don't you can't even fathom the littlest thing. Having the littlest thing. Having a cell phone. <laughs> but let me tell you something. God is able to do way, way beyond what you would ever imagine. And I've traveled literally now all over the world, getting to share my testimony, sharing about the gospel of grace. And God is faithful. He is good. And let me tell you what, over the last 11 years that I've been walking with him, I've been far from perfect. But the perfect one will never fail me and he will never fail you. It's not dependent upon you. It's not dependent upon us. It's dependent upon him. And he is good enough. He is faithful enough. He is worthy enough. He will not fail in you. He will not fail in you. He's big enough that his faithfulness covers all of us. The details of our lives, the things that we think are impossible. Stupid house. I mean, have a house. But today, God is changing my, my mind and showing me that he can do more and more and more. And the things on this side of addiction that you think are impossible are just like anthills. I mean, God is so good and he's so faithful. So when I share today, I'm gonna share some stuff. And I just want you to know that the gospel of grace will change your life. You know, churches across this country are preaching this message of God's goodness to you based upon what you do. There's a problem with that theology. How many of those pastors can stand up on a Sunday morning, say that they haven't sinned, 
See, they're preaching something that they can't even abide to. But see, God, his goodness to you is not on the basis of whether or not you sin or not. See, that's the reason Jesus came, for losers, to change losers and raise them to life and give them a new life that is tied up in the person of Christ. What does that mean, to be tied up in the person of Christ? It means that when God looks at you, he sees that you are in the perfect one, the one who perfectly obeyed, the one who is perfectly righteous, the one who perfectly deserves all of the blessing and all of the favor that was ever due to anyone for obedience because he perfectly obeyed. You are in, you are in that. And that is in you. So what God does for losers like you and me is he puts us in the perfect one who is fully qualified. He puts us in him and then he puts him in us, which means you are surrounded by favor. And favor is in you. I don't care how you feel right now. The gospel is not how we feel. The reality is you may be feeling like a loser. You may be feeling like a dropout. You may have been smoking meth before you came in here. You could be gay. You could be anything. Jesus is not identifying you by what you do. He says, come to me. I am the one who identifies you because of the goodness and the perfection of my obedience. I give you my perfection. You can't mess up Jesus' perfection. You wanna know why? It's not yours. How can you mess up something that you never achieved, you never earned? And your identity is in him. It is in the one who is perfect, who is qualified. He has qualified you. He has qualified you. Every one of you are qualified. You are in the one who is fully qualified. You know, God made promises all through the Bible. He made promises to some people on the basis of their obedience. And he said, you know, if you obey, he said, I will bless you. And then to other people, he made promises on the basis of their performance or their pedigree, their family background. He made promises on the basis of their family background. And the problem is that if we try to achieve God's blessings based on our performance, we fail. We cannot do it. How many of you have ever tried, has sworn off a habit, an addiction, and then given it into it again? Oh, wow, we're batting 100. There's, that's every one of us. See, that disqualifies us from God's goodness if he's relating to us on the basis of our performance. How many of you have a perfect family history? Anyone have perfect parents? You got perfect siblings? See, the Jews used to trace their family line the whole way back to Abraham. God made a promise to this guy named Abraham. They, he said, I'm gonna bless all your kids just because they're your kids, not because of anything they do. So the Jews used to put their confidence in that. We got a problem. I mean, my family tree is like, barely forks off, you know what I'm saying? I'm just kidding, it, it forks. <clears throat> it's just where it forks, you can't tell sometimes. But you wanna know, we are not qualified based on our performance. We are not qualified based on our pedigree, our family background. We are qualified because Jesus Christ has the perfect family tree. Now, how, how many of you think that Jesus Christ is the perfect pedigree? Who's his father? God, does it get any better than that? Did Jesus Christ perfectly obey did he perfectly obey? Guess what? He has perfect performance. It says in the word that all the promises that God has ever made are yes in Christ. Meaning that Jesus Christ qualifies for them all. He will never withhold a thing from his son, a good thing. You know, there's some batteries in my microphone, okay? They're right in here. And so <clears throat> if I take this microphone and I drop it in the sewer, where are the batteries? 
they're on the sewer. If I take this microphone into the Oval Office, where is it? It's in the Oval Office. See, these batteries go wherever the microphone goes. The condition of the microphone is always the condition of the batteries because they are in. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And 72 times in the New Testament, it says that you are in him. You know, Christian is only used twice in the New Testament, but in him identifies you 72 times. A Christian is someone who is in Christ. And so if Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, if Christ is perfectly blessed because of his perfect obedience, if Christ is perfectly righteous and favored by God and you are in him, what are you? You are perfectly blessed and perfectly favored. And I want to tell you that God is not going to be relating to you on the basis of you. He is relating to you on the basis of him. Is there anyone in here, if you were just... If you were just being really honest, really honest with me, is there anyone in this room that would raise your hand and say, I feel like a loser right now? Is there anyone that would say that? You know, you're in a really good position tonight. It says in Proverbs that God is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. You want to know why he saves those who are crushed in spirit? Because those who are crushed in spirit, who are crushed, they're at the end of their rope, are those who are done trying to put their confidence in their performance and in their pedigree. He is close to them because they're not trying to put confidence in anything other than nothing. They don't have anything. If you're at the tail end tonight and you feel like a loser and you've failed and you've given in, you've given in again, you've blown it, I want to tell you right now that Jesus Christ is able, he is faithful, he will not fail in you. You know, I had this whole thing planned, I, had like, I got like 11 pages of notes here. But, you know, as I'm talking here, I'm just, the, the gospel is so simple. The gospel, we, we complicate it. We make it so complicated. But the gospel is simply that if you're a loser and you put your confidence in the perfect one, he gives you credit for his absolute obedience and his absolute perfect performance. Is there anyone in this room that wants to put their trust in that man, in Jesus. Raise your hands. I wanna pray, I wanna pray right now. And I just, I wanna invite you guys to come up and talk to me after the service. I've been where you're at if you've been addicted to, you know, drugs and women men, if you're a loser, if you're a thief, if you're a dropout, I've been there. And I just want to say that God is faithful. He will not fail. Just let these words sink in. You know, it says in, the, it says in Isaiah, it says that Jesus was crushed. He was crushed for our sins. It says that it pleased God to crush him Why would it please God to crush his son? When Jesus hung on the cross, he lived perfectly for 33 years. He fully deserved all of the good things that God had ever promised. He was completely obedient, completely righteous. And on the cross, credit for all of the sin that you would ever commit. All of the sin. Not just your past sins, See, none of you had past sins when Jesus died for them. They were all in the future. All of your sins were transferred into his account on the cross. And God 
a righteous, just God who has to punish sin to be good. He crushed his son. He crushed your sin on the cross so that he would never have to crush you. He turned his head away from Jesus on the cross and he disowned his son so that he would never have to disown you. He will never turn his head away from you because of your failing, because he already did it in his son on the cross. And now he can look consistently at you. He can look at you. He can look at losers. He, look, he can look at failures. And he, can ne- he will never turn his head from you because he already did it. He crushed his son. And it says that Jesus was so happy to go to the cross because by knowledge of him, because people would hear about him, many would be made righteous, right with God, completely on the basis of God's goodness. If you raise your hand, I just want to pray for you tonight. Would you pray with me? Just repeat after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son. I thank you that he was completely obedient. He was completely righteous. And I thank you that all of my sin was transferred into his account. And all of the good right standing that he deserved was transferred into my account. I thank you for the gift of your perfect son. I thank you that you are not relating to me today on the basis of my performance, but you are relating to me today on the basis of Jesus' perfect obedience. I thank you that I am righteous, that I am blameless, and that I am free because that is what you have made me. Alan's going to stay up here for just a second. Can you give him a round of applause? So this isn't rehearsed because he had a sermon that he was going to preach and then God just kind of took stuff and went a different direction. So those of you watching on Zimmerman and, and, and Big Lake, I want you to know that right now this is the first time, this is the second service, but God's doing something special in this service. Um, when the first service ended, I asked, hey, Alan, can you, can, can you come out and meet somebody in the lobby? And so we ran out to the lobby real quick and I had to meet a guy that was two days sober and we prayed over him and um, he said, thank you so much. And then he and I left to get ready for the second service and Whitney came and found me a couple minutes ago and he had gone to his car and he got the rest of his meth and he broke it on the ground. We prayed with another guy up front that he just didn't want to live that way anymore. And he's like, I don't, I don't want this life and I want, I want God to change me and I don't want to. And I watched him give his life to Christ and then afterwards we were high-fiving and God had started a work in him. This is what God did in Allen back in 2001, right? Yeah. It's what he wants to do in your life. A lot of times you come to church and you feel like it's words. Somebody stands up, they read some words to you, and it's supposed to help. But it's more than words. When the words go from here into here, when Christ's message actually hits you heart, your heart, transformation happens, like this little seed that gets planted in there, and all of a sudden it sprouts and it grows, and there's fruit, and there's change, and there's adjustment, and you're never the same again. He's not the same guy he was because of Jesus. I'm not the same guy because of Jesus. His message, our message, the Crossing Church message is that when Christ died for you, you were forgiven, you're free, but you also can get a future. So right now we want you to know that, man, we want you to give your life to Christ. And I'm looking around the room and I'm like, I know that you prayed a second ago, but really what what I know is there's, there's people all over this room that what they really need to do is they need to honor God with a real commitment. Like, you know what, God, 
this kind of stuff is no more. I don't, I, like I'm gonna give you my life and I'm gonna, I, and I'm gonna ask you to do a work in me and you change me because I'm sick of trying to change myself. Because that's, that's why we come to church a lot of times. I gotta change myself. So I come to church and I don't change. And then I come to church and I don't change. And I come to church and I don't change. And maybe it's time we stop trying to change ourselves and we ask the only one who can change us to do it. To do the work. To free us from stuff like this and so much other stuff that we don't need to name. So I'm just going to invite you to stand to your feet. It's all over the room. If you just stand to your feet. And we're going to make a commitment today not to change, but to let him change us. You see the difference? Lots of times you come to church, I'm going to change. No, no, no. We're gonna ask the change maker to make a change in us. To free us from addiction. To heal our marriages. To free, to free us from this sin struggle or that issue. Or For some of you, you need physical healing, man. Just like whatever it is. What if we just called on the change maker to make the change? So we're going to do something different in this service than we did in the last, and I'm going to invite you to come to the front if that's you. Right now, I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat. I want you to come to the front. You need to, God, I need to change. I need God to change me. I can't change me. I want God to change me. I'm going to invite you to get out of your chair, and I want you to come to the front. I want you to come right up here to the front, all the way to the front of the room. Come on, all the way to the front of the room. I'm serious. Yeah, I, got, I, got, like, I want God to change me. I can't change myself. I need God to change me because I, I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't want this struggle. I don't want this issue. I don't want this problem. I don't want this worry. Like, I'm just, all the way up to the front. Like, guys, there's, 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 you guys can scoot, scoot, you can scoot all the way in. This side too. Come on, all the way in. All the way in. All the way in. We're going to ask God to be the one to change us and stop trying to change ourselves because that's what we're after. There's people sitting all over these seats, man that we've tried forever to change ourselves and we're the same person 10 years after going to church. What if you could be different? Right now we're gonna ask God to do the work because if he does the work, you'll never be the same again. That's the gospel, isn't it? So for all of you watching on camera, we're we're gonna pray for a second. I'm gonna invite you to to pray with us on camera. I'm gonna invite you to, to pray with us if you're in the seats. But for those of you who are up front, like you know that like this is your moment, man. This is this is this opportunity where you're gonna go, God, I don't want this life anymore. I want I want something new and different, and I need you to do the work. I just want you to pray with me. Everybody in the room is gonna kind of be with the guys in the front too. So just all of us together, I want you to say, Jesus Christ, I ask you to bring me change. Holy Spirit, I give my life to you. I ask you to move into me. Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sins. I ask you to bring me new life and joy, peace, strength. I make you my leader and my God. Bring transformation to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's the thing, um, there's a whole bunch of you up front that like this is a prayer that you're making right now and probably at some of the other campuses too. And What I would love to do is have somebody individually pray over each of your issues, over each one, over each one. So our prayer team and some of our staff are gonna meet you in the back of the room. While we're wrapping up the service, I'm, instead of going back to your seats, I want you to go to the back of the room. Our staff and some of our prayer teams are gonna meet you back there. And they're going to pray over every single specific thing that you're up here for. So that when you walk out of here, you walk out of here knowing that Jesus Christ is going to begin to do work in you. It's going to be, it's like, there's going to be, there's going to be difference, not because you tried, but because you trusted. And so guys, I want you to know I'm really proud of you. Something new is going to happen because of this. Something better is going to happen because of this. That's the gospel. We just give them a round of applause. If you guys could just go to the back of the room, our staff and some of our prayer guys are going to meet you right in the back. If you guys just go all the way to the back. Uh, Some of the guys that are on the prayer team, some of our staff, if you'd meet that group of people in the back of the room, that would be awesome. Um, For the rest of you, I 
I was praying tonight this would not be the normal service. I Man, I'm tired of normal services. You ever get tired of normal service? I do. <laughs> Somebody's like, no. <laughs> I get really tired of normal service. I want the power of God to hit our service. I want the power of God to hit your life. I want you to know that when you leave, man, you were in his presence and something occurred and life change happened. That's why we want to do church. What you just saw in them, I think all of us hunger for that a little bit. What if you fanned that kind of faith into flame this week? You got up in the morning and said, okay, God, if you're the change bringer, woo, here I am. Right now, today, open to it. What could happen? What could happen if not just Saturday night or Sunday morning? What if Wednesday you got up and said, woo, today's gonna be awesome. God's gonna change me again. Something cool could happen. Our part is just to believe he'll do it. What if you just believed? Man, it could be so good for you. Are you hearing me, church? You glad you came to church this weekend? Man, I'm going to pray for you and then you can be seated. Jesus, thank you for what you did this weekend. I thank you for freeing people from meth and transforming hearts and lives and overcoming in ways that we never dreamed possible. I pray that hope was offered, that peace was offered, strength was offered. I pray, God, that when we walk out of here, we have been so in your presence that like Moses had to wear a veil over his face because he was in the presence of God. I pray that we feel like we have so been in your presence that we're glowing with your goodness, walking in your strength and in your power forever different. Moses' glory faded. Help ours not fade. Help it be forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. Thanks again for checking out the Crossings online experience. We hope that you enjoyed the talk today, and we hope that you heard God speaking life over you. Now, we get the honor and privilege of hearing tons of stories every single week about how God is changing lives. If you have a story of your own that you'd like to share with us, go ahead and go to CrossingChurchStories.com and tell us about it. We would love to hear from you. And if you'd like to contribute to what God is doing at The Crossing, go ahead and click the contribute link below. Thanks again, and God bless.